This trouble is enough for today. Now we'll take time to remember Scott. Jeff, you come up. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today to remember my dad. He was the finest man I've ever known. And I hope that by speaking here today, I can pass on a little of who he was to you so that the good he did in his life can continue to live on. I'll start with a story. My first memory of the ocean was also a memory of my father. When I was very little, probably no older than four. And in this memory, Mom and Dad were taking me to the beach and let me sit down in front of them closer to the surf with my back to them. And I watched the waves crash into the shore, and I was struck by how enormous the ocean was, and how endless it was, and how powerful it was. The waves were high, and they were crashing heavily onto the beach in front of me, though I was a long way from the surf. Despite being so far away, one wave rose high above the others and rushed toward me. It was much taller than me. And I remember screaming. As I was screaming, I was lifted up, high into the air. And I realized that Dad had picked me up and was running up the beach with me, away from the wave. I didn't get a drop of water on me. And I realized that Dad had been watching me the entire time. And that's always how it has been with him. He has guarded and guided me for my entire life. As I was typing this, I was trying to decide exactly how much I should tell in order to properly illustrate this point. So I'll tell you another story which was personal to the two of us and to our family. From about 2012 to 2014, I struggled terribly with alcoholism. At that point in my life, I refused to acknowledge my problem for what it was. But Dad did. And he tried everything to awaken me to the way I was killing myself. He would call me often to check up on me, to see how I was doing, even if it was just to make conversation. He would ask me to come see him. So I would go to his office on the lunch break, hung up from the night before to talk to him. At that time in my life, I loved drinking, but I loved my dad too. Because he wanted to make time for me, I kept talking to him. And he tried so hard to break through to me in so many different ways to encourage me in my career to lift my spirits, to listen to me, to share his own life experiences, 
one thing that you have to understand about my dad. He never gave up. And eventually, because he was a man who never gave up, he got through to me. And at a time when I really needed to wake up, to be a man, to accept the truth and change my behavior, dad got through to me. One of those afternoons at his office, he took time again out of his day to talk to me. We had lunch again, like we had been, and he took out a photograph and showed it to me. And by that point, our extended family had seen a lot of suffering. By that point in time, my mother had already lost her father when she was in college. She'd lost her mother, our beloved Mama Grace, when I was still a child. Most recently, her dear brother Garth, my uncle. All of them are buried in the mountains of North Carolina, and my mother had to grieve each of them in turn. The photograph that my dad took out and showed to me that day, while I continued to stubbornly refuse to admit that I had a drinking problem, that everything in my life was the cause of my, everything else in my life was the cause of my misery, as I thought. He put that aside. He showed me I was wrong. He showed me a picture of my mother and Uncle Garth's funeral. And it was one of the saddest things I'd ever seen in my life. And he showed me that picture and he told me this. Don't make her go through this again with you. She doesn't need to bury her son. And it stuck with me. I don't know if Dad was aware that he had done it. But once again, he had lifted me out of danger. Because he was watching because he was there for me. I never forgot that moment. I never forget how Mama looked in that picture. And it didn't happen right away. But I started going to meetings. I started talking to professionals. And eventually, I started working a program of recovery. And though it's been a great struggle, I'm sober today. And I have been for a long time. I don't want to limit this eulogy to stories of just how dad was a rescuer or a protector though. He was so many more things too. He was a great friend to so many. To me, he was my best friend. He was my best man in my wedding. Through the time we shared together as friends, when I wanted to spend time with him, he always had time for me. And I'll tell you one last story. Dad encouraged me when I was about 12 to join the Boy Scouts. I hadn't included this in this uh, writing that I had here today, but I want to give special thanks to some of my friends from Scouts who have been there today to come and honor my dad. It means the whole world to me. I wasn't so sure about the Scouts at first, but dad had this way about him to push and encourage and not give up and ultimately inspire excitement. And it was hard to resist. It was hard to say no to him. By the end of our first introductory meeting with Troop 139, I'd made new friends and I was ready for our first adventure. We had a lot of adventures together in Scouts and he was very, very active participant. We went on dozens of treks from mountains to beaches to valleys, camping, hiking, biking, and boating. He went on so many of these trips with us and I learned through his example what it was to be physically strong, how to be a responsible outdoorsman, and how to become someone who others can rely on. At the capstone of the scouting experience is the two-week trek through New Mexico at the Philmont Scout Ranch, where small groups pack in their supplies, hike in, resupply at fixed points, and hike out. He helped condition me for that trek, hiking around a lake with heavy packs on every weekend, as well as helping me to ga gather the gear that would see us through. That trek was the greatest adventure Dad and I ever went on together. We traveled over 40 miles through the New Mexico wilderness, through dry, dry, excuse me, through dry deserts and wide prairies, up mountain switchbacks and down through gullies and riverbeds. And the whole time we talked. He told me about his life, his past, his work, and his struggles. He gave me advice. He listened to me about the things that teenage boys worry about. He was there for me. He was always there for me. We tested ourselves to the very limit on that trek, and at every point of it, he was at my side. That was the thing about my dad. He always had time for me. He was always a powerful presence in my life. If there was one thing I wish I could do for my son, it would be to have that kind of presence in his life. Of all the wonderful things that Dad achieved in his career, the design awards, the innovations, the incredible projects, the industry recognition and the publications, he did all of these without sacrificing one moment of time for his family. I would give anything to be that kind of father, to always have time for my family, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the demands of my career are, 
to be the kind of example he was, to be the kind of father he was. He's always been there for me. I know he's watching us now. Dad, I hope I've done right by you in sharing these stories. I hope you're proud. We're so proud of you. We all love you. And we will see each other again. me kind of think about the different relationships that we have with people and everyone's different the relationships he had with his brothers and his sister and my mom and they're all beautiful in their own way um, but I want to try to share with you what the essence of being his daughter was like so I have two stories to share with you first I want to go back to 15 years ago to 2007 this was well before my dad's journey into cloud computing and mobile and he has always, always been thinking about the world and how we interact with each other and how ideas flow and how they affect people, business, and how we live. Even then, he stood for innovation and ideas and change. He saw in 2007 that the world was about to change and that one invention was about to change the way that business is done, the way that we interact with each other, and that this one invention would change all aspects of mankind and the world that we live in. I know he saw all of this because he told me. I was set to graduate high school in May 2007 and he pulled me aside like he did. And he said, hey, I want to talk to you about something really special. These conversations with my dad, as many of you know, where he was excited about something that he wanted to share, was never in passing, it was never rushed. He always made really important things a moment and he always had great timing. He would be very patient when he had something to share with you, to pick the right moment. And he told me, something big is about to happen and I want you to experience it. He said, I want you to have the very first iPhone for your high school graduation present. It was released in June 2007. At that time, there were no iPads, there was no cloud. Razor and Nokia dominated the phone, the phone space and we had no internet in your pocket. So I went off to UNC Chapel Hill with this new device that nobody else had. And people asked me, what was it like to have an iPhone at UNC when nobody else did? I told my mom it was a boy magnet, because it was. <laughs> and some could see this gift that he gave me as a material gift. But if you understand my dad at all, and the why behind what he did what he did, it was because it wasn't about anything material at all. It was about ideas and innovations and the change in the world and wanting others to be a part of that change. And as much as my dad loved technology, he had conviction about everything he felt strongly about and cared about in life, sometimes stubbornly so. His loved ones, his wife, my mom, who he made sure everyone, including us, knew how much he adored, the Steelers, design and creativity, Porsches, and even Apple. He didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk with all the things that he loved, and his conviction was strong. I made the mistake one Christmas, of buying him an Amazon Alexa. That was a big no-no. She was not even allowed inside of the house. <laughs> and for her colleagues who are here and here virtually, when he gave those talks and speeches that were only from his phone about how to run a business with your smartphone, I want you to please know that that was not smoke and mirrors. He truly ran his business entirely from a smartphone. A little bit before he would be on, he would text all of us and say, don't text me, I'm going into a meeting, I don't want anything to pop up, and I'm sure we messed up, and we did sometimes. Um, but we know his devotion to mobile to be painstakingly true because there were no computers in the Kohler household at all. In fact, we had a laugh as we were sitting writing his obituary, three of us were sitting together, and my brother was fumbling with dad's iPad turning it left and right with mutters of my fat fingers, I don't know how dad did this. <laughs> if he believed in something, you better believe he was committed to it. The second story I have for you is about the greatest gift that he ever gave me. 
He believed in equality and he believed in supporting women and the advancement of women in the workplace. From when I was a young age, he wanted me to be able to stand fully and completely on my own two feet for good reason. He wanted his girl to succeed and nothing to hold her back. He told me this one thing over and over since I was little and he made me believe it so fiercely. He told me, you can do anything you want to do in life. He was fearless in his pursuit of everything and he wanted the same for me. I carried this with me at UNC, and then later when I decided I wanted to be a physician assistant and care for patients, I carried it with me when embarking in leadership roles in the hospital system. It's not just that I could hear him saying I could do it. I felt it in the depths of my soul because he made me know that I could do it. So, recently, taking everything he taught me, spoken and unspoken, I saw an opportunity in my field with the advent of telemedicine due to COVID and the billions of dollars being poured into the space came up with a business plan and shared my plan with a doctor I work with who's very forward. She's very successful and fearless in her own right. She said, I love it and it would work, but you have about a 10% chance of them going for it because it's so innovative. I could have backed down and in that moment I was scared, but I took a deep breath and channeled my dad's fearlessness, requested a meeting with the president of the physician group of our four hospital system and 50 ambulatory clinics and the COO. And I said, I have an idea that I believe will change the way that we deliver primary care. They had me in their office within a few days and I presented the plan and told them I wanted to do many new initiatives and impact patient access and quality of care. And I wanted to do it all from Atlanta, Georgia. My dad was with me that day and I believed in myself with everything that I had. And they said, yes, we are now building a novel program with, te with technology something that to my knowledge has never been attempted before. So the greatest gift for my dad was him making me believe fully in myself. One of his colleagues said that there isn't one single torch that can be picked up from Scott, but many flames that can be ignited. So from this story, let one of those flames be instilling in a young woman or young man a deep-seated belief that they can accomplish anything that they set their mind to. And for those of you that he impacted and had those relationships with him, please know that he believed in you, and he still does. And carry that with you, as you know that you can do anything that you want to in life. is great when it works. <laughs> I'll be sharing Gwen's words with you today. My dear Scotty, do you remember the song by Dan Fogelberg we played at our wedding? Longer than there have been fishes in the ocean, higher than any bird ever flew, longer than there have been stars in the heavens, I've been in love with you. I thought we would grow into our 90s together, hobbling into the grocery store like really old people do. That we would travel abroad once it was safe from COVID, maybe to Ireland first. That we would visit Claire and Jeff and Luke more often, celebrate together as Laura marries her forever love. And keep marveling as we watch our little buddy Finn grow up. That we would take more walks, watch more movies, go to the pool, take more golf cart rides, or just sit side by side in our recliners, each doing our own thing. During the 40 years I was with you, I felt safe and secure.
strong and powerful, competent, intelligent, and able, free and equal, happy, alive, and loved. What a lucky woman I am to have been loved by such a special man. I just hoped it could have been longer. I'm going to share a few words about how Scott's presence blessed my life. My first blessing was meeting Gwen. And I didn't know God was going to double up on me with Scott. When Scott spoke to you, you felt like you were the only person on the planet. He would hang on your every word. And you would feel like there was no other place he'd rather be than sitting across from you. I hope I do this justice. These are just a few words. Loyal, dreamer, he wasn't one who thought outside of the box, because with Scott, there was no box. <laughs> Everything was available and possible, and he thought that for you too. He was passionate and compassionate. He was a true lover of Gwen. His adoration for her was a sight to behold. To Laura and Jeff, he was their biggest fan. Dad and Opa. Gracious with his time and his heart. And up for conversations that opened minds and hearts. He had vision to see every possibility in himself and in you. Once you were connected to his heart, he was like a pit bull. He just wouldn't let go. Time couldn't change it, and distance couldn't shake it. He was always at the ready, with smiling eyes, and open arms. At this point, we'd like to open up and let you have the opportunity to share your thoughts and love for Scott. Scott, but a neighbor up in the bridge, been many times together uh, in their house that had so much love and was so refreshing to go to. I remember the, the atmosphere was always welcoming and loving, and the music, I especially remember the music system that was in the house and, and was jealous of that, but uh, was able to appreciate the music. And uh, everything that has been said resonates with me, too. I just wanted to add that, uh, Scott, I really am grateful for you, uh, for what you taught me. Um, I had occasions to uh, lead a consultative body many years, um, and I learned from Scott, because of the things we talked about, about vision, uh, being, uh, you're walking, you're being practical, but not limited in our thinking, and then applying the principles of 
action and obviously to business. He didn't do anything totally alone. He had the ability to share that vision and to enable the rest of us to see it and to catch his enthusiasm and his stubbornness about achieving those, those things. So uh, in one group that I was chairman of for a while, uh, then I moved and Scott took over the chairmanship. And I just noticed how much more unified everybody was and how their vision actually enabled them to accomplish more. And so I learned a lot from that, and I want to thank Scott and, and I send my condolences to the family and my appreciations. I have to apologize for that. We're going to have a video tribute now from uh, Scott's Work Friends, created by Joan, Joe Inslee. Such an inspiration in this in this industry. The sky was the limit with, with Scott. He always shows up. And that's beautiful and wonderful. I've just been so incredibly impressed with his knowledge and his generosity. He's always someone who's there for us. And if there's any lesson in all of this for us, it's to tell the people you care about how much they mean to you while they're here and live your best life, you know, using his inspiration. To Scott's family, I just want to say thank you for sharing this incredible man with us. Um, I met your dad and your husband back in 2014. And he just literally took me under his wing. God, we love you. We love you. Um, and my little brother's gonna take care of you when it's that time, so thank you. Your love for the industry and the people in it has permeated everything you've done and everybody who knows you has been impacted by that. My thoughts and prayers are with you and your family right now. That has probably influenced a lot of us in a lot of different ways and touched us in, uh, in very deep ways, right? Um, what I really want to say to him and to his family is thanks for sharing him because he's so insightful. He was so passionate. He's so caring and giving. I'm so happy that all of us are here to celebrate him. Um, more importantly, for his family to understand what kind of an impact he really had. God bless you guys. Love you. Um, take care. I've never met Scott in person, but once he heard my diagnosis, which is uh, ALS, uh, he uh, he reached out. He reached out to me, and uh, in a very generous fashion. And uh, it, uh, you know, I have some sense for what it's, what he's going through, and uh, I just really appreciated that. Wanted to tell him that. And such a nice person, just such a gentleman, always. Oh my goodness, Scott, I'm going to miss you, and I know we all are, and uh, thank you, Scott, for everything you've, you've given to all of us so generously. Your spirit won't ever be forgotten. I can just so tell that he is a man of passion, of forward thinking, and is really uh, never spent any time being in, in strife with anybody. Everything was always so amicable. Happy I'm here with all of you, celebrating the great man that he is. For someone that didn't, we didn't meet, that his warmth, his generosity was felt, um, his kindness, and he just shared a great perspective and, you know, just brought you into the conversation. And that was fantastic. I cannot thank you enough, Scott, for all that you've been for the industry and for many of us on an individual basis. Your generosity of spirit and your tenacity and your talent and just know that I'm, I'm sending my love and um, like everybody else wish this was different hoping that the next days are filled with joy and that you guys have time to um, enjoy your memories because this is the time to do it and share those and and and, and to find a little bit of time to grow with each other um, God, you know Godspeed Scott 
and may Chris be with you. We love you. He just really was one of those really decent guys who was a good human being on top of being uh, very knowledgeable. I was always so impressed by his willingness to always be learning something new and not only learning something new, but sharing it for the benefit of everyone else too. He was very giving of his time and his knowledge with everyone he met. And every time he talked about you, Gwen, or his children, you could just see the love and uh, respect he had for you and how proud he was of his family and how much he loved them too. So um, that obviously came through every time he talked about his personal life. He valued people and he, um, I just, uh, my prayers are with you as you go through this time. The first time I met him, I thought he was going to be this 25-year-old gentleman. Um, but that's what I loved about Scott. Such a really cool, forward-thinking guy. And um, he always, you know, he always makes everybody feel comfortable. You know, I was new in the industry and, and I didn't really know anybody out there. And he was just so welcoming. And I don't... I don't know if there's anybody out there who can make somebody smile like Scott could. So, you know, I don't have a whole lot to say because all the thoughts are in my head, but I absolutely love Scott and everybody else does too. I know it. Greatest guy. a fantastic, terrific, awesome, amazing, stellar, phenomenal, and fabulous day today. Stanley, friend of Scott's. You don't have to worry. <laughs> uh, I'm the one who knew Scott back probably 50 years ago. We met through a mutual friend, Jim Clark. Scott and Jim were best friends, but unfortunately, Jim died very young, 46. And <clears throat> although I'd met Scott a couple of times, it wasn't until the night that Jimmy died. So I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm not going to tell the whole story. Because there's elements of it that probably, uh, well, maybe I will tell you the whole story. <laughs> but it was back when Scott had brown hair and I had some. <laughs> and uh, his uh, significant other, uh, Jim's significant other, who lived in Canada, was trying to track down Jimmy one night. He was a well-known uh, advocate for clean water here in North Carolina and was a very public figure. <clears throat> I was living in California, and uh, Terry uh, gave me a call and said, I can't find Jim. Where is he? I said, I don't know. I haven't talked to him since uh, this morning. We talked almost every day, almost like Scott and I did uh, years after that. But uh, I didn't know what to do. And as the night grew, grew on, uh, Jim lived alone, so we didn't know what to do. And <clears throat> the only person we knew in the area was Scott. So I called Scott at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was living in Greensville. Jimmy was living in Durham, basically. And I said, Scott, we've got a problem. I said, I don't know, you know, Jimmy's not answering his phone, Terry's at wit's end, what do we do? And Scott said, well, hell, I'll get up and drive uh, over to Durham and see what's going on. He lived out in the country, uh, not far out in the country, but on a plot of land in a ranch house where uh, 
it was pretty, not quite wilderness, but in that direction. And so he went there, and he called me when he got there around 3 in the morning and said, He's dead. So the door was locked. He looked through the window. And we're on the phone going, he's dead. He's dead. What are we going to do? I said, well, okay, you got to get in. He said, yeah, should I break the window? I said, yeah, go ahead, break the window. So he got something out of the car. I don't know what it was. And he went over to the window that was by the door and he knocked the glass out. And he was there on the staircase. He had a heart attack. He was 46. So, long story short, there's parts of the story that maybe I said I might tell, but maybe I shouldn't if you're at the house later on. Maybe I'll tell you. I don't know. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that Jim was protected, being this political person. And so, when he broke the windows, the dogs in the neighborhood started barking. People thought there was a burglar. They called the police. The next thing you know, we got a crime scene there. Scott's in the back bedroom being questioned, like, what's going on? Are you a burglar? Are you a thief? Are you a murderer? <laughs> and this went on for days before the police finally said, okay, you can now come in. The point of the story is that when we went to the funeral for Jimmy, Scott and I embraced. And it was that moment where we knew we would be together of our life. He used that moment, and, and it, it, it hit me the same way, that moment when we came together it was through somebody's passing. And so when we come, when I go to funerals, uh, I hope that some relationship might come together like that as a result of what is ultimately the best and the worst day in people's lives. I've always had the pleasure of knowing the family. They've been terrific. Uh, they've put up with me and my idiosyncrasies for almost 50 years. I think they've worried from time to time that I'd lead their son astray, or their husband astray, and their father astray, which I did my best to do. Uh, we went down to the Caribbean on several occasions, boys' weeks out, uh, and those are the stories I can't tell you, but they're pretty tame when you really get down to it. But Scott will always be in my heart, and I love him dearly, and uh, I love you all, too. As we bring the time for sharing to a close, is there anyone else that would like to share? in prayer. God, our comforter, you are strength for us in times of grief and distress. Lord, we ask that you grant rest, solace, and peace of mind to family members and all who were with Scott during his last days and waning hours. We give thanks that family was present during those final precious moments. May family and friends of Scott look back at all the years they spent together with him and draw comfort from cherished times together. The numerous holidays and family celebrations, gatherings, and family and business trips. Through these and other memories, may they all find assurances of Scott's eternal love for them. Lord, may his grandsons, Finn and Luke, know of Opa's love for them and Opa's hope for their bright futures. Loving Lord, keep watch over Gwen. Support her through those times when the house is too quiet and she misses Scott's daily companionship. Help her find strength 
in the remembrance of things that they did and shared as a couple during their 40 years of marriage. Guide gently Laura and Jeff through this difficult time of adjusting their lives to their father's absence. May all he demonstrated in his life to them help them carry onward to remarkable and fulfilling lives. Grant peace to each who knew Scott's warm friendship, nurturing care and thoughtfulness, and his inspiring ideas as to what is possible. O oh Lord, we thank you for the lessons in how to live life which Scott taught us, to always be thinking and evolving, and to hold a dear love for family and those people who matter in your life. Lord God, we depart with your love surrounding us just as we know that your love surrounds Scott. Bless him and keep him, and may your love shine upon him forevermore. Amen. Well, the sun is sure. Songs, and I can't sing the blues and 
more But I can sing this song And you can sing this song When I'm gone It won't be long before another day We gonna have a good time And no one's gonna take that time away You can stay as long as you like So close your eyes You can close your eyes It's all right I don't know no love songs And I can't sing the blues anymore But I can sing this song And you can sing this song when I'm 